Today we have the third lecture in top anatomy and it will be dedicated to surgical interventions on nerves, tendons and muscles. So, okay, and we will start with surgical interventions on nerves. And as always, to understand the sense of surgeries on any organ, we first of all have to know its structure. And I'm sure you studied the structure of the nerve uh, at your histology classes, but <clears throat> just to revise a little bit. So, first of all, nerve consists of numerous nerve fibers. Yes, so it not only nerve fibers, but yes, it includes mainly nerve fibers or axons. And then we said that uh, each nerve fiber, each axon is covered, if it is myelinated fiber, yes, it is covered by Schwann cells. And then there is connective tissue and there, is, there are blood vessels. And so uh, there are several connective tissue capsules in every nerve. So first of all, there is endoneurium that surrounds individual neurons. So these are, this is this myelin sheath of every axon, here we can see it, that surrounds every axon. And it is formed by loose connective tissue with capillaries for neurons. Then several neurons uh, are covered by perineurium like several neurons, they form fascicle, and uh, this fascicle is covered by perineurium. It is, again, connective tissue, and it contains uh, blood vessels. And so the whole nerve is covered by epineurium. It surrounds the entire nerve, and it is dense connective tissue. If endoneurium and perineurium was formed by loose connective tissue, then this epineurium, it is covered by dense connective tissue. <clears throat> that is the structure. And so in case uh, during surgery, we will uh, use this basic anatomy knowledge. So now let's talk about classification of nerve injuries. Uh, there are several classification. Uh, the, one of them is classification by Seddon that was invented in 1943. And according to it, uh, all the uh, nerve injuries, they are divided into neuropraxia and then axonate masses and neurot masses. So neuropraxia, it is a temporary interruption of conduction without loss of axonal continuity. It is the mildest type of peripheral nerve injury. So usually it cases in case of compression of the nerve or in case of um, excessive traction, and in this case, um, we can deal with a sensory motor problems distal to the site of injury. So here, as we can see in this diagram, endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium, so all the membranes, they are intact, and recovery of nerve conduction uh, deficit is full and requires from days to weeks. So in case of neuropraxia, surgical intervention is not required. Exonate masses, it is a type of peripheral nerve injury when the axons and the myelin sheath are damaged, but the endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium remain intact. So yeah, it, case, it happens uh, in case of compression and most often traction and uh, ischemia. Uh, for example, in case of fractures, intraneural injections, and freezing. And again, we can deal with sensory and motor deficits distal to the site of the lesion. Axonal regeneration occurs uh, after such type of uh, injury, and recovery is possible without surgical treatment. Because, once again, I'm telling you, in this case, uh, all the coverings are not damaged. So endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium, everything is fine. Just there is an alteration in the axon itself. But because there is no um, diastasis, there is no gap be between uh, the proximal and distal ends of the axon, recovery is possible without surgical treatment. Sometimes surgical intervention is required because of scar tissue formation, just to dissect this scar tissue. 
And so the heaviest, the most severe nerve injury, it is neurotmesis. It is a total disruption of the entire nerve fiber. So sensory motor problems and autonomic function defects are severe. And so because of lack of nerve, surgical intervention is necessary. And uh, these two last um, types of nerve injuries, axonotmesis and neurotmesis, they are followed by valerian degeneration in the distal nerve of uh, distal end of injured nerve. What is valerian degeneration? We will say uh, very soon. So here you can see neurotmesis. So everything is uh, uh, damaged, like there is a total uh, disruption, yes, we said, and due to an, uh, an ability of tissues to contract, proximal land goes proximally, distal land goes distally, and so we have a diastasis, we have a big gap between proximal and distal end, and these ends cannot uh, join each other without surgical intervention. So we have to assist to connect these two ends of the nerve. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, so now patomorphology of the nerve injury. What happens uh, with the nerve during nerve injury? I think you also studied it uh, in patternat at your pattern anatomy classes. So, first of all, at the very beginning, there is a partial red in what happens in proximal part of injured nerve. Uh, there is partial retrograde axonal degeneration. Like it's, it can um, be observed at the distance from several millimeters to three to five centimeters maximally. And then after partial degeneration, regeneration takes place. So formation of growth cone here you can see. And if, if proximal and distal ends of the nerve, they are together, then growth cone enters distal end of the nerve. If growth cone, or if um, there is a big gap between proximal and distal ends of the nerve, then neuroma is formed in case if the nerve was not sutured. Neuroma, it is one of the complications of nerve injury. So it is traumatic neuroma and, or pseudoneuroma. Because in um, the oncology, in um, benign uh, tumors, you will also find such a term, just neuroma. It is a benign tumor that consists of neurons. Here we deal with traumatic neuroma or pseudoneuroma or amputation neuroma, the other name. It is a result of a post-traumatic hyper-regeneration of the nerve, but it is not tumor, yes? So etiology. In which cases does it happen? Uh, presence of a barrier between proximal and distal parts of injured nerve, such as scar. Uh, big diastasis, diastasis, big gap, yes, between the ends of the nerve. And absence of distal part of the nerve. If just there is not a distal part of the nerve at all, like in case of an amputation, then um, uh, grows cone, like this axon, it starts to grow and it has no place where to insert. Yes, there is no myelin sheath where it can insert, and so neuroma is formed. And symptoms of such symptoms of the neuroma, it is a pain syndrome and paresthesia. This is. So before suturing of the nerve, in case of formation of neuroma, certainly it should be removed first. What happens, like in proximal end of the nerve, everything is finally restored, yes? What happens in the distal part of an injured nerve? So first of all, it is complete degeneration of axons, or it is known as valerian degeneration. Then Schwann cells were regenerated, so covering was regenerated, but if a uh, nerve was not sutured, if a growth cone didn't enter this myelin sheath, uh, into, uh, didn't enter Schwann cells, then we will have a trophy of the nerve. And the region that was supplied by this nerve will be deprived by nerve supply. And finally, we will deal with muscular atrophy. And so everything will um, suffer distally from the place of an injury. 
So yes, what we have to remember is that speed of axon regeneration is 1 to 1.55 millimeters per day. That is what we have to understand. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, which operations on nerve trunks are distinguished? So in operations on the nerve, first of all, what we have to know uh, that indirect approach is used. We were talking about it at the previous lecture. Once again, I'm telling you that uh, we, again, nevertheless, we have to know the projectional line, but we intentionally should avoid the place of projectional line, and we should make a dissection somewhere away from the projectional line of the uh, neurovascular bundle. In this case, um, if we use indirect approach, uh, the incision of skin and fascia, which does not coincide with the projection of the nerve, avoids the formation of a common scar between the nerve membranes and other dissecting tissues. If nerve is involved into the scar, it causes its compression and it causes um, impairment of its function. So the most common operations on the nerve trunks are neurolysis and neurotomis, resection of neuroma, nerve suture or neurorafi, raffi means suturing, yes, neuroplasty in case of a large diastasis. Uh, or uh, neuroplasty, the other name of it, it is nerve grafting, nerve grafting. <clears throat> so yeah, okay, let's start with neurotomy. So neurotomy, obviously, it is the intersection of the nerve. So how to do it? Uh, the nerve trunk isolated for two centimeters and taken on wet gauze strips is crossed by the blade of a safe razor. So yes, please, I want to pay your attention. We do not use scalpel. We do not use knife. We use only safe razor, the sharpest instruments we have, because it allows us to um, avoid microtraumas on the end of the nerve. Uh, among the neurotomas that are currently performed, the most common surgery why, in which cases, yes, do we use neurotomy? It is vagotomy for peptic ulcer of the stomach and duodenum. Vagotomy. So dissection of the vagus nerve, yes, branches of vagus nerve that go to the stomach and duodenum. Um, why do we do it? Because stimulation, parasympathetic stimulation of both stomach and duodenum causes production of gastric juice and intestinal juices and... Finally, self-digestion will start and formation of ulcer. And we, uh, by means of vagotomy, we block production of these juices, so we stop formation of ulcers, peptic ulcers. Neurolysis. Neurolysis is an operation aimed at releasing the nerve from scarring that occurs after a blunt effect on the nerve or after a bone fracture located near the passage of the nerve. So how to do it? We excise pathologically altered tissue, create anatomical conditions that promote nerve regeneration, and under the microscope, yes, when we perform surgery of the nerves, we usually use um, small instruments, yes, and we usually use even lenses to increase, um, to improve, our vision to increase to zoom what we see yes so under the microscope the tissues compressing the nerve are cut with a scalpel according to the projection of the nerve trying not to disturb the integrity of its branches so this is neurolysis um, like for example yes in case of dupu trend contracture which we studied which we study this week, yes, when there is an excessive growth of connective tissue in the tissues uh, in the hand, yes, ulnar nerve as well as the other nerves, they can be compressed and sometimes neurolysis is required to restore function of these nerves. Uh, suture of the nerve or neurorafi. So the goal, the aim of neurorafi is to create the most favorable conditions 
for the regeneration of damaged, damaged nerve fibers. So the main aim is to decrease diastasis, to concite, to, yeah, to concite proximal and distal ends of the nerve, yes? To allow the growth cone from proximal end of the nerve enter the distal end of the nerve. So uh, into which types are sutures of the nerve divided? First of all, according to the time. Uh, so time-based classification of the nerve sutures. Primary, uh, early secondary, and late secondary sutures are distinguished. So primary nerve suture is applied during primary surgical treatment of the wound. So we have an injury. We are performing primary surgical treatment. Yes, we like dissect all the necrotized tissues. We treat everything with antiseptics. And so we see the injury of the nerve and uh, we stitch it. This is primary nerve suture. Early secondary or early delayed suture is applied within three or four weeks after the injury, uh, after the healing of the wound by primary intention, primary intention. And late secondary, late, late suture is applied after four weeks after the injury or after the wound healing by secondary intention. So these are three classification of the nerve sutures according to the time of application. So yeah, we will start with primary nerve suture. Conditions for the applications or for the application of primary nerve suture are the following. So it is absence of infection in the wound, like if a uh, wound was sterile and it is nearly never sterile, yes. Okay, qualification of a surgeon. So if, for example, the injury took place somewhere in a village on the field, yes, and you brought a patient to the village hospital, uh, like there is a very high chance that he doesn't master skills of neurosurgery. So in this case, certainly we should delay nerve suture till the best times. Uh, then uh, sufficient time for a surgical intervention. Yes, again, to apply primary nerve suture is absolutely not compulsory. Like there are not so many advantages uh, of it. And that's why if there is a massive and numerous trauma, yes, and if there are not so many doctors uh, and uh, there are many patients who require treatment, then we again can delay nerve suture. We can delay nerve suture. Yeah. Okay. Then proper technical equipment of an operation theater. So yeah, we have to need to have a special uh, neurosurgical instruments, of course, and the opportunity of neurological examination of a patient before a surgery. So first we have to estimate neurological status of a patient. Like does he have any symptoms of nerve def deficiency or not? We, what are the contraindications for primary nerve suture? Actually, contraindications, they originate from indications, yes? So uh, severe condition of the patient, like hemorrhagic shock, yes, it is contraindication, infection of the wound, crushing of the wound when there is no chance to find ends of an injured nerve in the wound, absence of a highly qualified surgeon or equipment in the operation theater. Oh, in this case, we apply secondary nerve suture, and actually it has many advantages. So first of all, operation wound is clean because we have already um, prescribed antibiotics, yes, and we performed primary surgical treatment. And then performing of surgery by highly qualified doctor and uh, boundaries of nerve resection are easier to determine. And yeah, we, you have to remember once again that in case of a secondary nerve suture, we always use indirect approach, indirect approach. So far from projectional line. What are the requirements for the nerve suture? Requirements for the nerve suture. So it sh first of all, it should connect ends of the nerve without tension. Uh, suture shouldn't involve nerve fiber, that is, uh, they should pass only through connective tissue membranes, only through connective tissue membranes. 
uh, di diastasis between proximal and distal ends of the nerve should comprise 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter. Nerve fascicles should be adapted. So torsion of the nerve should be avoided. Yes, so. Mm -hmm. And nodes of the suture should, shouldn't be located between proximal and distal ends of the nerve. So no, nodes of the suture should be located laterally. Because if there is, um, if they are located between proximal and distal ends, they serve as a barrier between proximal and distal ends. And so it is like a, creates a condition for formation of neuroma. And so suture, also suture of the nerve, shouldn't impair its blood supply. Shouldn't impair its blood supply. <clears throat> So the main stages of the new uh, of a neurography are the following. First of all, as always, as in any uh, type of surgical intervention, we perform exposure of the nerve. We expose the nerve. Then neurolysis in case of secondary suture, so we remove all the adhesions, yes? Then we perform examination and the determination of the boundaries of resection of the damaged nerve. Uh, the fourth point, it is mobilization of the ends of the nerve and preparing the bed, like the place where we will finally put the nerve. Uh, then resection of damaged areas of the nerve trunk perpendicularly to the longitudinal axis of the nerve. And so once again, as well as neurotomy, so both neurotomy and this stage of neurography, uh, always any incision of the nerve is performed by safety razor blade, by safety razor blade. Uh, then nerve suturing. Uh, usually we use monofilament nylon suture. It is the preferred suture type because of its ease of use and minimal foreign body reactivity. We were talking about it, yes? In case when our suture, when uh, we want the suture not to cause any additional traumas, we use monofilament suture. Like in case of neurography, certainly it's very important. But we have to remember that knots are not very secure. Um, that's why we have to make, to tie many knots. And so 7-0 to 10-0, it is the size of the thread and needle should be at traumatic and it should be piercing. And then the seventh point, it is closure of the wound and immobilization of the wound for two or three weeks. Why do we need this immobilization of the wound? Yes, because uh, you have to understand, after you, um, after you perform nerve suturing, after the surgery is over, function of the nerve will not be restored. The only thing we did we just connected membranes of the nerve, yes? And now we need a time for the growth cone to enter the nerve, to, to enter the distal end of the nerve. And it takes time. We have said about it that speed of regeneration of the nerve, it is one to 1.5 millimeters per day. So you can count uh, the length of the distal end and you can um, un actually estimate when exactly patient will restore his motor and sensory functions in the damaged area. So it won't happen at once. And to provide better um, regeneration, we certainly have to immobilize them like this operated area for two or three weeks. Uh, yeah, according to the method, there are two types of nerve suture. It is epineural and perineural uh, nerve suture. They are two. So epineural nerve suture, uh, here you can see it. So first, um, yeah, here you can see that we take a safety razor blade and we remove neuroma. Yeah, like we remove a distal part of the nerve, of the injury, yes? Um, re we remove the neuroma. And the ends of the nerve excise, well, the, uh, yes, the ends of the nerve on neuroma, they are excised at the level of healthy tissues by very sharp razor blade for the incision line to be extremely smooth. 
to avoid formation of new adhesions. And so then we just we mobilize the pinurium, yes, so the most the outermost covering of the nerve, and at the distance of one millimeter from the edge of the nerve, perpendicular to the surface, we inject the needle, holding it through a pinurium, through a pinurium only, not through the nerve fibers, please. Mm -hmm. And then we take the needle again, like we pass the needle, we conduct the needle through the one end of the nerve, through the one end of the epineurium, then we retake the needle and inject it into the opposite end of the nerve from the inside, under the epineurium. So we start from outside and go inside, and then from inside to outside. Uh, this is epineural suture of the nerve. So then we tie a knot leaving the end of the thread three centimeters long. Why three centimeters? Because it is monofilament suture, yes, monofilament thread. It can slip out. We should leave a very long thread. And similarly, placing second, no, like we do the same uh, as the other, like 180 degrees from the first knot. And then we stretch, the, stretch up in urium and put one or two stitches in the anterior circumference, in the anterior semicircle of the nerve, and one or two stitches in the posterior semicircle. And the stitch nerve after that is placed in a seat prepared within the unchanged tissues. So you can see we apply interrupted suture on the, onto the epineurium of the nerve. So perineural uh, nerve suture, it is more secure, but it has uh, its own disadvantages. So what are we doing? We expose the nerve, we remove a pineurium on a distance of five to eight millimeters at both ends of the nerve to open, uh, to reach fascicles, yes? So to reach perineurium that covers fascicles. And so then we stitch each fascicle separately separately, like, yeah, the needle for perineural suture separately passes through each group of fascicles. Uh, the restoration of integrity of the fascicle starts with the most deeply located um, fascicle, and then we gradually go upward and we stitch the rest fascicles. For each fascicle, two, three sutures should be applied. So that is the difference between epineural and perineural suture. In both cases, epineural and perineural sutures, we stitch only perineurium and epineurium. We, once again, I'm telling you, we do not stitch nerve fascicles. Ah, no, yeah, now I want to show you a video of a nerve suture.
see that between two holding threads, yes, we start to stitch uh, first anterior, again, but it's, it would be better if we start from posterior end. So we apply interrupted sutures. One in the center and two between. Hold the holding threads and the central. Well, that's how it should like look like, yes, uh, in the um, best case. Well, but here uh, it was a sciatic nerve, yes, like it was the easiest nerve we might stitch because it is big. And uh, just imagine how to suture the other smaller nerves. It's like a microscopic uh, job. It's like very complicated. So neurosurgery is not so easy mm -hmm. okay so um okay that was about nerve sutures so what are the methods of approximation of the ends of the nerve in case of large diastasis so in some case uh when we try to approach proximal and distal ends of the nerve to each other we receive a very high tension uh, in case of high tension, um, normal functioning of the nerve is impossible. Um, like just stitches will be cut with the time and again, um, proximal and distal ends will move far from each other. So what to do in this case? There are several Vs, certainly not all of them are used nowadays, thanks God. Uh, so, okay, what can we do? Stitching in the flexion position of the limb. Yeah, we can do it. If diastasis is less than eight to 10 centimeters, we can stitch in a case of in the flexion position. And after the healing, after the regeneration, we can extend the limb. And uh, due to elasticity of tissues, um, length of the nerve will be increased with the time. Then uh, we can move the nerve to a new shorter course, replacement, replacement. Yeah, it is also possible. Um, so, for example, if as, you know, some nerves we know do not have a straight course, like for example, radial nerve, it, it goes along the spiral uh, in the upper arm, yes, no, and there are other nerves which do not move very straight, and we can a little bit change the course to save a few centimeters. It is possible, yes, to change a course. 
a replacement. So bone resection. So certainly nowadays we do not use bone resection. So like, yeah, it, like a very, it's very smart way. Yes, for example, if there is a nerve and uh, there is a, di a big diastasis, uh, we can take a long bone, we can perform resection of a bone, and yes, a limb will be shorter, but we will be able to stitch the nerve. Um, yeah, it, such methods were used when nerve grafting was not so widely used and now we have bone grafting nerve grafting sorry and certainly we prefer this um, certainly we will prefer this then to make a person uh, an invalid uh, till invalid till the end of his life yes okay so neuroplasty or nerve grafting it is performed when diastasis is at least two or three centimeters and when mobilization of the nerve is irrational or harmful. So favorable uh, outcome of neuroplasty is achieved when defect is not more than five centimeters. When it is more than five centimeters, then usually outcome is not quite good. And so allo and xena grafting are not efficient. So they were again used in the past. Nowadays we use only auto grafting. So you remember, yes, from the last lecture. So auto grafting, it is uh, grafting when we take a material from ourselves, from the same patient. Yes, uh, allo grafting is when we take material from the other human, and xena grafting when we take material from uh, the representatives of another species, so from animals. So in case of nerve grafting, allo and xena grafting are not efficient. And we can use only auto grafting. Which auto grafts can be used uh, without causing any additional damage to the patient? We can take those nerves which have many anastomoses, yes? And if we remove this particular nerve, uh, nerve supply of the other regions will not suffer a lot. Yes, will not suffer much. So what can we use? We can use sural nerve and anterior branch of the medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, superficial radial, superficial branch of the radial nerve. Uh, so these are the most popular auto grafts. And so graft should be approximately 10 to 20% longer than the gap to be filled as the graft inevitably shortens with connective tissue fibrosis. We have to consider it also when we take grafts. So allografts, uh, yes, there are some advantages, but anyway, nowadays they are nearly out of use. So grafts can be banked. Yes, so we can take and we can save them until they are required for somebody. Uh, there is no need for sacrifice of a donor nerve. And surgical procedures are quicker without the need to harvest a graft. When we take autograft, certainly surgery will be longer because first we need to remove a nerve from the place where it was and then to stitch it where it is now required. In case of allografts, we do not need to take a nerve. It has been already taken, and so we just stitch it, and surgery will be shorter, yes? However, allografts are not as effective as autografts, mainly due to the immunogenic host response, so mainly due to rejection reaction. That's why uh, usually allografts are not used. So uh, finally, uh, regarding uh, surgery of nerves, we can say that uh, despite more than 100 years of intense laboratory and clinical investigations, results of nerve repairs are somewhat discouraging, with only 50% of patients regaining useful function. The current standard of treatment is immediate epineural repair with nylon suture, if primary repair would place tension on the anastomosis, nerve cable autografts are employed to bridge the gap. So why do we use epineural? Why do we prefer epineural, not perineural repair? Because in case of perineural repair, uh, there is very much suture material and it prevents uh, growth 
of neurons. Yes, it creates barriers. And so that's why, yes, we prefer epineural suture nowadays. That was about the nerves. Now about surgery of tendons. So tendon actually has a very close structure with the structure of the nerve. So tendon is a terminal structure of striated muscles by means of which they are inserted to the bones. And so, yes, you see that tendon consists of collagen fibers, and these collagen fibers are covered by endotendon, that is, again, connective tissue, like endonurion in the nerve, yes, and several collagen fibers form fascicle that is covered, uh, again, by connective tissue, and um, they form secondary fiber bundle or fascicle, and then several secondary um, bundles, uh, they form tertiary bundles, and finally, all the tertiary bundles, they form tendon, which are covered by epitendon, epitendon, and it is, again, connective tissue. So the sense is the same, like in the nerve. So what are the requirements for tendon surgeries? First of all, just like in nerves, again, indirect approach is preferable, as it prevents formation of adhesions between skin and tendon, in post-operative period. Strict asepticity. So here it is even more important than any surgery of the nerve because synovial schists are very susceptible to the infections. Delicate manipulations on the tendon uh, because severe post-operative edema causes adhesion of synovial schists with surrounding tissues and disrupts tendon function. Uh, prevention of tendon drying. So uh, if some of you attended our surgical club, yes, and you saw how tendons are sutured, you saw that we should always make, we should always try to save tendon wet. Uh, because again, when synovial sheath gets uh, dry, it um, contributes to formation of the adhesions. And again, it will impair tendon function. And immobilization of the limb after the surgery also is required to prevent wound dehiscence. Mm -hmm. So what are the main indications for tendon surgeries? Uh, first of all, this, these are traumas and it, their consequences and deformities of locomotor apparatus, innate and acquired. These are the main indication for tendon surgeries. Mainly, we deal with tendon surgeries in the tendons of flexors and extensors muscles in the hand. Uh, though so also we stitch sometimes calcaneal tendon, yes, uh, and uh, sometimes we stitch patella tendon, but Mainly, in the majority of cases, we have traumas of the hands and injuries of the tendons of flexors and extensors. And so we have to know what is the difference. So extensors, extensor tendons, they are easier to stitch. Be, why? But yes, they are easier to stitch, but they are more often also to be injured. Why? First of all, they are superficially located in, in uh, comparison with the flexor tendon. Uh, they are flattened in transverse section, uh, and uh, they are extra synovial in the most part. Like we, we are discussing it with some groups this week, and with the other groups we will also discuss it later, that um, flex tendons, yes, they are covered by synovial sheaths along the fingers everywhere, yes, and Extensor tendons, they are not covered by synovial sheath. Uh, proximal end of the tendon after the rupture, if we are talking about extensor tendons, does not significantly move proximally. It is due to the tendinous intersections, yes? So tendons of extensor digitorum muscles, they are connected with each other by means of tendinous intersections. That's why even in case of a total injury, total disruption of the tendon, it won't go significantly by means of these intersections. In flexor digitorum muscles, there are no such intersections. That's why in case of an injury, in case of an injury, 
uh, in the flexor digitorum muscles, we have um, like yes, uh, tendon goes significantly proximally. <clears throat> Okay, and so yes, uh, extensor tendons, they get damaged due to open and close injuries. So even just a compression, even just, yes, a stroke can. And flexor tendons, they get damaged mainly due to the open injuries. It's because they are deeply located. Sorry. Okay, so let's continue. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so due to the uh, structure, due to the anatomical structure, all the tendons are divided into the synovial coated or intrasynovial tendons, like for example, musculus, uh, tendons of musculus flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus, and unsealed or paratenon coated um, tendons, such as Achilles tendon, and the musculus extensor digitorum, so they are extrasynovial. They are extrasynovial. <clears throat> you know, you are getting less and less. I think from the next week, uh, we can cancel lectures at all. They are useless, yes? <clears throat> Okay, so in case of synovial coated, uh, there is a synovial sheath. Yes, so tendon is covered by synovial sheath. Uh, here you can see it. We were also discussing with some of the groups uh, this week. So uh, this synovial sheath consists of uh, two layers, visceral and parietal layer. So visceral layer of parietal sheath, or oh, sorry, synovial sheath is known uh, is named epitenonium, here we can see it, and parietal layer is peritenonium, peritenonium. And so, yeah, and at the place where tendon is adjoins the bone, where epitenonium continues to the peritenonium, there is a mesotendon, uh, which forms vincula, and through this mesotendon, vessels and nerves they enter the tendon. So they, that is the main source of blood supply for synovial coated tendon. That's why in case of an injury of the tendon or in case of tender vaginitis, inflammation of the uh, synovial sheath, we should never touch this part of the tendon that adjoins the bone because if we break it, then we will uh, impair, we will, um, deprive the tendon or by blood supply and so will cause necrosis. So uh, what are the other sources of blood supply of the tendon? Uh, so proximally it is from the muscle belly of the into the tendon and so also from the large arteries passing along the tendon but it is usually insignificant uh, mainly from the mesotendons as you can see it here and from the periosteum at the place of the tendon insertion and from the vessels of synovial sheath and from paratendinous fatty tissue. But yes, so there are three main. It is muscle belly, it's proximally. Distally, it is from the periosteum at the place of tendon insertion and also um, along in the middle, it is meso these are mesotendons. mesotendons. Yeah, we have also to know that here, like specifically in the place where um, blood supply of the tendon occurs only from the mesotendons, there is a no man's land. Uh, 
uh, it is a term that was introduced by Banel in 1948. So it is zone between distal palmar fold and distal interphalangeal joint. Tendon repair in this zone has the least success rate due to such difficulties with blood supply of the tendon. So when we perform surgeries in this region, we should be especially delicate, especially accurate, not to disturb blood supply of this region because it is very poor. Okay, so due to the types, uh, according to the types of tendon damage, there are closed and open. So it's ob obviously, yes, it's uh, nothing, there is nothing complicated in it. And so the most common operations on the tendons are tenorophy, it is suturing of the tendon, tenotomy, it is in cutting, incision of the tendon, yes, tenolysis, again, it is revealing of the tendon from the um, adhesions, tenodesis, uh, tenoplasty or grafting, and transposition of tendons, transposition of tendons. So requirements for tendon sutures. So the essence of the tendon suture is to sew the tendon ends along the entire width of the gap and keep them fixed in this position for three to four weeks for the complete healing. So what are the requirements? Actually, now we will um, talk about requirements which are given by a great Russian surgeon, uh, Yuri, uh, Yuri Vichgenilidze, but then later we will compare them with the other uh, requirements by yes, Strickland. And you will compare it yourself, and actually they are the same. They are the same. Okay. So what are the requirements? First of all, suture should be simple and techni technically easy to perform. Suture shouldn't significantly impair blood supply of the tendon. When applying the suture, it is necessary to ensure the preservation of a smooth sliding surface of the tendon and limit uh, the use of a minimum number of threads. Uh, the suture should hold the ends of the tendons firmly for a long time and prevent them from splitting. And so it should be low traumatic for the tendon and it shouldn't create a barrier between connecting surfaces. So actually, actually, uh, requirements for the tendon sutures, they are nearly the same as the requirements for the nerve sutures. And again, yes, uh, t according to the time of application of tendon suture, uh, there is primary repair or primary suture. It is like, yes, it is the best in case of the tendon. It is golden period and uh, it should be applied within 24 hours in a clean wound. And so it gives the best results. There is also delete primary repair or early second early secondary suture yes it should be applied from 24 hours up to 10 days after after the injury and it is performed in case of a suspicion of infection and uh, when there is a question for viability of the tissues or when per patient came late so conditions for an application of the early secondary repair uh, primary suture, if primary suture was not applied, but the wound was healed by primary intention without complication. So in this case, we apply secondary repair early. It is should be applied between 10 or 14 days, up to four weeks after the injury. And late secondary suture is that one that is applied after four weeks. So usually when the wound has been already healed by secondary intention. So which suture materials are used and instruments also? So certainly atraumatic instruments are used to prevent splitting of tendon fibers. To prevent splitting of tendon fibers. Uh, needles are straight or curved, three eighths, and they are cutting, not like in the nerve, yes. And so section is round, oval shaped or triangular. And suture material is multifilament or monofilament thread, non-absorbable. And so usually we use silk, 
Odacron, polyester, mercilien, pralien, or surgical steel wires with uh, chrome and nickel. Uh, tendon sutures are classified into four groups. So uh, first, it, these are sutures with knots and threads on the tendon surface, on the tendon surface, then sutures with knots on the surface of the tendon and threads inside, uh, then sutures with threads inside the tendon and knots between the ends of the tendon, and some other sutures. So here you can see sutures with knots and threads on the tendon surface. It is suture by brown, suture by Frisch. No, there are many uh, types. Okay, in which cases can we use this suture, this type of sutures? Certainly, only in cases when tendon is extra synovial, when it is not covered by synovial, synovial membrane, synovial schist, because if it is covered by synovial schist, um, tendon will not be able to slide inside the synovial schist, friction will start, and so it will finally form adhesions or another injury, so function of the tendon will not be perfect will not be perfect. <clears throat> uh, then, a sutures with knots on the surface of the tendon and threads inside. It is suture by Langer and suture by uh, Dreyer. Uh, then, this is the type of the suture which we usually use um, at our surgical Olympiads, yes, and which we usually study. It is suture by Cuneo. It is suture with knots between the ends of the tendons. This suture is perfect for intrasynovial tendons. So everything, threads are inside the tendon and knots are between the ends of the tendon. So nothing is between tendon and visceral layer of synovial sheath between a tendon and uh, epitendon. Yes, so it is perfect for, it is like a golden standard for intrasynovial tendons, for tendons of flexor digitorum muscles. Krakow suture is very secure suture and it is, yes, it is suggested by a great Russian surgeon Krakow, but you can see there are very many threads on the surface of the tendon, so it is applicable only for extrasynovial tendons. So, yes, here you can see it. It is a preferable suture for Achilles tendon, quadriceps femoris, or patella tendon, yes, muscle and rotator cuff muscles. And it is contraindicated for intrasynovial suture because there is very much, there are very many threads outside of the tendon. <clears throat> no, so, yes, here you can see another time many different types of sutures and so all the previous which we studied they were core sutures core sutures like sutures which connect tendon itself usually after we apply cord suture we also apply on the surface epitendinous suture and it can be different and it is required for the proper adaptation of the wound margins, of the wound ends, yes? So in case of epitendinous suture, it should involve into the stitch only epitendon, only epitendon. And it should adapt margins of the tendons, like ends of the tendon. And yes, after that, immobilization Long immobilization is required. No, so this is one of the ways of immobilization, very cruel. But for the children, we cannot explain them just not to move the fingers. Yes, we should do something like that. Okay. So tenatomy. Uh, tenatomy. As a, the, the instance of surgery, it is a dissection of the tendon to eliminate excessive traction of muscles. 
uh, that is open through the skin incision and closed by a special instrument through the skin puncture. For example, in which cases is it performed? Um, for example, in case of the contracture of the Achilles tendon and thigh in adductor muscles, um, and in case of torticollis, it is um, like a contracture in sternal hand, head of sternocleidomastoid muscle. Mm -hmm. So, okay, this is tenotomy. Tenalysis. Uh, the essence of surgery is uh, to release tendons from the adhesions with surrounding tissues. And so, after the adhesion dissection, tendon is covered by the facial plate, usually from fascia lata in the inferior one third of the thigh to prevent re adhesions. Tenodesis. Tenodesis. The essence of this operation is subperiosteal or paraosteal fixation of peripheral segments of the tendons of paralyzed muscles. Uh, for example, uh, it is indicated in case of surgical treatment of foot drop after the trauma of the spinal cord, sciatic, or perineal nerves. And so look, for example, there is a foot drop. Yes, uh, there was an injury of perineal nerve. And we tried many things, but we can do nothing to restore the function of the nerve. And in this case, like to provide, but like just to improve quality of life of the patient, we need to shorten, extend the muscles to fix a foot in an extension position. Yes. And so that's how, for example, we do it. The nadesis by putti, the tendons of musculus extensor hallucis longus and musculus extensor digitorum longus are exposed and crossed, and they are fixed in a channel drilled in the tibia and carried out in the opposite direction and stitched with each other on the posterior side of the tibia uh, at a functionally advantageous position of the foot. So to make it extended, yes, to prevent its flexion. And then for a patient, it will be easier to uh, move the feet, to move the foot from one place to another. I hope you understand me. Okay. <clears throat> I hope you hear me. Uh, so the, the, yes, the other way it is standardized is by chuckling. Uh, in this case, tendons of musculus tibialis anterior Musculus extensor digitorum longus and musculus extensor hallucis longus are exposed in the lower one third of the leg. And two transverse bony channels are formed in tibia through which distal ends of the tendons of the muscles pass. And so actually sense is the same, just in this case we see there are two bony channels and we stitch tendons again on the anterior surface, not on the posterior surface. Uh, tenderplasty. So tenderplasty is used in case when we need to lengthen the tendon or to shorten the tendon. So for the tendon lengthening, we can perform longitudinal Z-shaped incision of the tendon. And then like we can a little bit expand this tendon, yes, and stitch just its ends which, with each other. To perform tendon shortening, we can resect the tendon, just take, remove some part of the tendon and stitch the ends, or we can create duplication of the tendon as we can see in this diagram. And one more a type of the surgery, it is transposition of tendons, transposition of tendons. Uh, indications, it is peripheral nerve injury. So again, we usually do it, uh, yes, in the limbs. For example, in case of an injury of the median nerve, for example, yes. Mm. Yeah, let it be median nerve. In case of the injury, okay, let it be ulnar. 
it is easier. In case of the injury of an ulnar nerve, we know that ulnar nerve supplies medial half of flexor digitorum profundus muscle. So this medial half of flexor digitorum profundus is now unable to perform its functions and to flex the hand, to flex the finger, sorry, to flex uh, ring and little finger. What are we doing in this case? We, are, we take the tendons of this uh, ring and little finger, flexor digitorum profundus muscle, and we stitch it to the tendons uh, to the tendons, yes, of the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle that is supplied by median nerve. And then this flexes, the tendons of flexor digitorum profundus contract together with flexor digitorum superficialis. So this is transposition of tendons. Uh, how to do it? So there is fish mouse, like we are create like a fish mouse, yes, you can see, end to end suture. So you see it really looks like a fish mouse. It is Palver Taft method. Or there is also end to side repair. So we stitch not to end, but by to end to side repair. So anyway, we stitch the tendon of the muscle that doesn't have blood supply, or sorry, nerve supply, to the tendon of the muscle that has it. And then contraction of this muscle is caused by contraction of the muscle where we stitched the tendon. Uh, tendon grafting. So which autografts are usually used? Palmaris longus, very long tendon, yes we know. Musculus plantaris, musculus extensor hallucis longus, um, musculus flexor digitorum superficialis, uh, musculus extensor digitorum. So again, we take for autografts, as autografts, those tendons uh, whose functions can be substituted by other muscles, by, yes. So for example, if you are talking about musculus extensor hallucis longus, we remember that uh, extension of the uh, foot can be performed by musculus tibialis anterior and extension of the um, first two can be performed by musculus extensor hallucis brevis, yes. So we can take its tendon and so, so on. So this, uh, ten, uh, these are grafts, these are the grafts which we can use for tendon plasty or tendon grafting. And one more very short thing, yes, a few words about surgery of muscles. So what are the requirements for the suture of muscle? So suture, if suture of tendon and suture of nerve, we usually perform just in case of trauma, in case of any deformity, yes, then suture of muscle we perform at nearly at any surgery because we first dissect uh, for the surgical approach and then we should to reconnect them. Yes, we should reconnect them. So what are the requirements for suture of the muscle? First of all, only absorbable suture material is used. Then all the points of entrance and exit of the needle must be symmetrical to perform uh, a good compatibility, yes? Uh, in case of a transverse incision, U-shaped or eight-shaped sutures should be applied to prevent splitting of the muscle. Uh, I will explain it at the next slide. Fascia surrounding the muscle should be taken into the suture, and knots should be pulled up to the contact of the wound margin. So we shouldn't pull it very hardly, just up to the contact, because muscular tissue is very loose, yes? And sutures of the muscle can be cut. That's why we shouldn't pull too hard, too much. So look, here you can see how to apply, no, how to apply sutures in case of longitudinal and transverse incision of muscles. So we, if we made longitudinal incision, so fibers are moving longitudinally, then we can just apply nodula single, simple, interrupted sutures, yes? And we make a suture, we pull and tie the knot, and fibers will join each other, yes? If we made a transverse incision of the muscle, sometimes it is required, though in most cases we try to avoid it, but sometimes it is required. Then, look, we made an incision transversely, and so uh, fibers go also transversely, yes? If we make just 
simple nodular suture. It means that direction of the thread will coincide with the direction of muscular fibers. So then just the chance that the thread will cut, like it will just go out from the, this tissue is very high. That's why we apply not just simple sutures, but usually U-shaped sutures to catch at least few muscular fibers into the suture, or maybe Z-shaped suture or eight-shaped suture. Uh, by this way, we, at some extent, at some degree, we decrease chance of cutting the thread, of cutting the tissue by the thread. I hope you understood me. <clears throat> okay, uh, that is all I wanted 